So in the mesoplagic zone, we have two different types of animals. We lump all animals into two groups. They're either non-migrating fish or animals or migrating fish or animals. Um, non-migrating fish stay in the mesoplagic zone all the time and the migrating fish are going to migrate up to the surface at night to feed in the epiplagic zone. And depending on what type of animal they are, they will have different adaptations in order to do that. So the non-migrating animals, um, if you're a krill or a copepod, you're going to just stay in the mesoplagic zone and eat detritus, like in the form of marine snow that will be drifting by. But if you're a fish shrimp or squid, you are going to be different. So these guys are going to be sit and wait predators, meaning they're just going to sit there and wait for anything to pass by, and when that passes by, they're going to jump out and eat it. And in order to be able to do that, they have to have adaptations that reduce the amount of energy that they use, because it can be a long time in between meals. And again, there's not very much food down here, um, and so they have to be able to conserve as much energy as possible um, in order to make it to their next meal. So what they do is they have flabby, watery flesh instead of muscle. And the reason for this is muscle takes a lot of energy in order to maintain because it's, it's very energy costly. So if you work out and you build muscle, you will actually burn more um, calories than you would if you don't work out because muscle takes more energy. And so these fish and squid and stuff have flabby, watery flesh rather than muscle to reduce energy consumption. They also do not have a swim bladder because it also takes a lot of energy in order to fill and maintain, so they don't have one. And they don't need one, actually, because all of these adaptations that they have actually make them neutrally buoyant in the water, meaning they can just float at a constant depth and they don't have to swim in to stay at that depth. So they don't need a swim bladder, they just kind of float there on their own. Um, these fish and stuff also have soft, weak bones, um, and they don't really have defensive structures like spines or scales, because they don't really have muscle, and you need bone for muscle to attach to, and since they don't really have that, um, then they don't need those big, strong bones. And spines and scales are just too heavy, and would pull them down in the water, so they don't have them. And so those are the adaptations that these non-migrating animals would have. Migrating animals are going to be a little bit different. They are going to migrate to the surface at night and then return to the depths during the day. And the reason why they do this is because there's more food in the epipelagic zone than the mesopelagic zone, so that allows them to get food. But they're also less visible to the predators at night because if they were up there during the day, they'd be very obvious if they were, you know, like black. They'd stand out a lot. So they're less visible to predators. In order to be able to migrate, they have to be able to swim, which means that they need muscles and bones, which means that they need a swim bladder in order to be able to swim with their muscles and bones. So they do have well-developed muscles, they do have well-developed bones, and they do have a swim bladder. However, from the depth that they're migrating from um, to the surface, there's a big pressure difference there. And so these animals have to be able to deal with that change in pressure um, in their swim bladder. So remember last or earlier, earlier this semester we talked about how if you take a uh, fish up from the deep too fast, okay, the gas expands and it can actually push their, their swim bladder out of their mouth. So these fish actually need to be able to rapidly adjust the volume that's in their swim bladder so that they can come up and down in the water column very fast. The swim bladder can also be filled with fat instead of gas because fat will be less dense than water and help them to be buoyant. Um, so they will actually fill their swim bladder with fat instead of gas. Just to give you an idea of um, kind of how far these creatures are traveling, a krill that is migrating up to the surface at night, if um, relative to its body size, it would be like you climbing up Mount Everest every night in order to feed and then swimming or climbing all the way back down and doing that every day in order to feed. That's like what these animals are doing. So it's quite the migration for them and this is the largest migration that happens on Earth. So how did we discover these vertical migrations? Well, um, we discovered these during World War II when we began to use sonar. And what happened was these fit or these ships and these 
submarines were using sonar in order to kind of like see where stuff was and um, they were getting these false bottoms on their sonar screen. And basically when the sound hits the bottom of the ocean and comes back it's a very crisp clear picture. But these, the sonar was getting kind of these false bottoms that they called the deep scattering layer which gave kind of like these shadowy plots like um, very very weird for them. Uh, so they called them a false bottom because they knew that they weren't actually the bottom of the ocean. And what they noticed was that during the day the deep scattering layer is at depths of about a thousand to sixteen hundred feet in the water. And then at sunset that deep scattering layer would rise to the surface. Okay? And it would actually um, rise closer to the surface or stay further down in the water based on the amount of light. So if the, it was a full moon the deep scattering layer would stay deeper in the water than if it was a new moon. Or even it, like they noticed if just a cloud would pass over the moon, um, that would cause the deep scattering layer to come up closer to the surface. So it's very dependent on light intensity. What they did is they towed a net behind the boat at the depth of the deep scattering layer and they pulled it up. And what they found were a bunch of lanternfish, but also krill, shrimp, copepods, jellyfish, squid, etc. Basically all of these animals that were part of this deep scattering layer. Most of the animals that are I just listed don't actually contribute to the deep scattering layer, but the fish that have swim bladders do, because that's actually what the sound in the sonar was bouncing off of, was the swim bladders. Whereas everything else, like a jellyfish, the sound would just pass right through it. So the fish were actually contributing to that deep scattering layer. These vertical migrations are really important because they actually bring food into the deep water because a larger population of animals can be supported because they actually allow, um, there's more food if they come up to the surface, so a larger population can be supported. And it also helps to increase the food supply because um, when all of these animals are coming up and then coming back down, they create a small amount of like vortices and stuff that will help to pull some of that marine snow and stuff down into deeper water. And then as they are migrating up and down in the water column, they can become food for other animals as well, those sit and wait predators that don't migrate. The sense organs of a fish um, in the midwaters are interesting. They are very, very, very sensitive to light. Um, and a lot of fish will actually have what are called tubular eyes, meaning your eyes are normally like round, a sphere, but these guys, their eyes are shaped more like tubes. Um, and in these eyes, they actually have two retinas. So you have a single retina at the back of your eye. These guys have two. What it does is it allows um, for the fish to capture more light and to actually see in two directions at the same time from the same eye. And I'll show you a picture and explain it a little bit more. Um, so basically it's like they have two pairs of eyes um, when they actually only have one. And then some fish, if they don't have like really good vision, they'll also use odor to find their food. So this picture shows you the eyes. Okay, so this is the tubular shape of the eye with the one retina and two retinas. So you can actually get light that comes in from the side and will hit this retina and then light that will come in from the front and hit this back one which will help to or which will allow them to see from two directions. All right. So most of the predators in the mesopelagic zone rely on vision. And because they rely on vision um, and there's nothing to hide behind in the mesopelagic zone, the prey use camouflage as their defense because swimming and defensive structures are way too heavy and there's nowhere to hide, so they try and camouflage themselves. Basically, the basic, basic strategies are the same in the ep mesopelagic as in the epipelagic zone, so they'll have counter shading. It'll just look a little bit different. They'll have a black back and silvery sides rather than um, uh, like a blue back and a white belly. They'll also be transparent, so it's a pretty good strategy if you're trying to be camouflaged just to be see-through so that nothing can see you. Um, 
And then they'll also try and reduce their silhouette. So they will be laterally comp compressed to try and reduce the, the size of the silhouette that they produce. Um, and then deeper in the water, fish can actually be like black or red. And you, if you think about it, it makes sense because why they would be red and stuff. Because red light actually gets filtered out from the water the soonest. Um, and so the way that you see is that that light bounces off your eyes or bounces off of something, comes back to your eyes, and you detect it. If you are red down in the deep mesopelagic zone, there's no red light there to hit you and bounce off and go to some predator's eyes. So you basically just look black. You can't actually be seen, which is pretty cool that they can do that. Here's some pictures just to show you kind of the ideas. So this is a lancet fish with counter shading, so it's black on the top, silvery on the bottom, krill that's transparent, and then a hatchet fish which is laterally compressed, compressed from side to side. And you can see the tubular eyes of the hatchet fish. So, fish down here will also be bioluminescent. And bioluminescence is used for counter illumination. And here's the idea behind this. Um, these fish have photophores which produce light on their bellies, on their ventral side. And they will actually produce light from these photophores that exactly matches uh, the background light that is coming into the water through, from the surface. And so what this does is it helps to break up the outline of the fish and allows them to um, hide even further from their predators. So here's a picture to kind of help you see. So this picture right here shows you what the outline of a fish or a squid would look like. And then if you put it in water, um, it helps to like make it a little bit fuzzy because that's what water does. Um, and then this it would be a counter-illumined fish or squid. So basically the background light would be the white, okay, and they have these photophores which exactly match that background light. And if you take that and put it into water, which makes it a little bit fuzzier, it really helps to break up their silhouette and makes it harder to tell what they are um, when it's like this rather than like this. So it, it helps them to hide from predators. It's called counter-illumination. Um, so, fish may think that they're pretty sneaky using counter-illumination, but some fish actually have yellow filters on their eyes, which filter out one of the wavelengths of light that is produced in bioluminescence, and they can now tell what is natural light coming in from the surface and what is artificial light with these yellow filters. So they can actually kind of like... Um, see the prey anyways and go and find it and eat it. There's different ways to produce light in the mesopelagic zone. They can actually have photophores which will produce, uh, like ha they'll have their own specialized tissue to produce light or they'll have symbiotic bacteria. And then some creatures will actually produce bioluminescent fluid um, and that would be helpful for them because they can release it into the water, kind of like a squid releases ink and it creates like a flash of light which will blind predators and they can get away. Bioluminescence is also used to attract mates. So you'll have different patterns of photophores on different species, but also on different genders of the same species so that you can tell, oh, like that's the same species and opposite gender, so that would be my mate. They also use it to attract prey. So like the anglerfish will have its lure that's bioluminescent in order to attract prey. And then some creatures can actually have light organs around their eyes um, that allow them to see. So they, around their eyes they have these organs that produce light which act like headlights and allow them to see in the dark. And some of them, pretty crazy, will actually produce red light um, because there's a lot of red creatures down there and when they produce red light now they can see those red creatures. But most of the other creatures that are down there cannot see red light because they don't have the ability because it's deep and they don't need to because that wavelength of light doesn't penetrate that deep. And so now these creatures can see the things that are red and not be seen by their predators, which is really, really helpful and cool for them.